Good morning. That's to test my mic. It's an honor to be here at the Connell Conference and very special to be able to visit Ireland again. Shortly after I arrived at Columbia University in the fall of 2001, I agreed to give a series of presentations to alumni groups around the uh, Middle Atlantic region of the states. Uh, that winter, uh, January, I found myself driving down from New York City uh, to Philadelphia along the Jersey Turnpike in a snowstorm. Uh, but I found myself going across the bridge into the city, found the hotel, parked my car, went into the uh, room where the presentation was to be held, set up like this, and uh, my talk was to begin at 8 o'clock, but by 8.15, there was only one other person there. I suggested I should go ahead and speak, and she said that would be great. Uh, so I went ahead, and I was using slides that evening, and I asked if she would run the slide projector as I spoke, and she agreed to do that. I gave my talk, uh, one of my better talks, and um, when I was done, I asked if she had any questions. Uh, she said, no, I have no questions. So I sat down briefly. I said, you know, I need to get on the road. I need to get back to New York City. She said, no, 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 you're going to stay. I said, no, it's snowing, I have meetings in the morning, the turnpike is always a challenging path, I'm going to be going now. She said, no, no, you are going to stay. I said, you don't get it. I've got to get home tonight. It's snowing outside. She says, no, you don't get it. I'm the second speaker. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad that you're all here and you're not off in the bay <laughs> swimming or something like that. Yeah. So um, I was asked to talk about uh, the topic of how we are repositioning ourselves as academic and research libraries uh, as learning and research is transformed, and to think about the relationship that we have uh, with our students and, and with, our, with our faculties and our researchers. But I decided that was a very boring title, and I wanted to suggest to you some alternative titles. So, uh, Ken Kesey, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He once told us that you can count the seeds in the apple, but you cannot count the apples in the seed, which to me means that we need to understand what's going on, but also recognize that so much of what we're working with uh, is unpredictable and unmanageable, and we need to embrace and accept and work with that. So another title, Pioneers Need Frontiers. And as I work with librarians across the United States and around the world, I see that we are embracing the sense of being pioneers in a, a very real important redefinition of what we are and what we do uh, as libraries. Uh, the Trump Loy Library of the Future. Uh, I think we maintain a certain image, uh, a familiarity for our users as they walk into our space and use our libraries and work with us as librarians. But we all know that what's going on behind the scenes in the real library uh, is very different than what people perceive and what people see. Um, the education of Henry Adams. Um, order breeds habit while chaos breeds life. And I would argue that we want more and more libraries that are full of life a recognition that the way our researchers work and the way our students learn is going through a transformation that we need to understand and be able to respond to. And lastly, and I felt this more and more this past year as president of the American Library Association, sometimes a scream is better than a thesis. Uh, we, tend, we, we lean towards thesis as librarians, and sometimes in the current economic and political environments in which we operate, uh, we need to find more opportunities to scream about what it is we are and how we, in fact, transform and support the communities that we serve. So I'm going to try to work through a series of questions. Uh, on this screen and the next screen, you can see the questions I'd like to pose, looking at issues of trends, uh, what we have done as 20th century libraries, does that still matter? Um, where do we fit into the national, global, library, digital uh, developments? Uh, are we focused on the human objectives of those who use our libraries? How can we create more organizations in libraries that are more entrepreneurial, more focused on effective change, uh, thinking differently about strategic action? Uh, we'll come to that. Uh, we have, I think, an expanding political an advocacy role. At least we feel that very powerfully in the States, and I suspect that will grow as well in the European 
sector. Um, we'll hear more about issues of, of staff development and leadership development tomorrow, but I want to touch briefly on the changing nature of staff expertise and the organizational structures and cultures that we're working with. Um, I talk about the uh, kumbaya of library cooperation, uh, where we've sort of lived and worked for the last half century, and how we need to radicalize the ways we work together and the way we collaborate uh, in the library community and with other partners. And how do we build a much more strident approach to innovation, leadership, and transformation, particularly in the context of the digital technologies that we're working with? So those are the questions that I'd like to work through. So let's start with the trends. Um, each of us could generate our own list of important trends that are having an impact on our work in libraries. On this screen and the screen that follows, I've identified some that are important to me. I'd like to highlight a couple of them. Uh, clearly, our users are approaching us with very different sets of expectations, uh, different behaviors that we've not had to work with before. Uh, we, in response, uh, and to my uh, dismay, continue to maintain largely redundant, inefficient library operations. Uh, I often say in the States, we have 3,700 academic libraries. Why does every one of those libraries have to have an acquisitions department, a cataloging department, a preservation department, a digitization department? Uh, they become sort of shallow expertise environments where if we collectively invest it in those capacities, we could free resources to really grow in other areas of need uh, within our community. Um, we have, uh, to a large extent, maintained what I call aging service paradigms. Let's call that the reference desk. And we know that more and more we need to be where our users are and not expecting that they're going to approach us in the physical library and admit they don't know something and ask for our help. So we need to think differently about how we provide those services. Uh, we also know that we have the opportunity to build much more scale and, and network effect through our aggregated work. And, uh, uh, I think the collective action that we're seeing, particularly in the collections area, uh, is putting more and more focus on our unique resources, our special collections, our archives, rare books, manuscript materials. Um, here's a bunch of others that I think will be very, very familiar to you. Obviously, our users are mobile. Um, we know that we're putting a lot more focus on the openness of the content. I'll come back to that. Uh, we're working in a much more globalized uh, environment in terms of the way we do our work. Uh, we're being asked very hard questions uh, by those who fund us and those who administer us. Uh, in terms of the assessment. How do we know that we're delivering uh, quality uh, service to those that we serve? Um, we know that the growing importance of information policy in terms of our ability to serve our communities, and it's, whether it's internet developments or copyright or issues of privacy, uh, we are touched in very powerful ways about uh, information policy. It's really a condition of what I call mutability. Uh, a recognition that things are moving constantly and it's impossible to pin everything down. Uh, and it's these uh, provocative, I think, uh, 21st century trends that are, are very important in our thinking about working with and developing our library cap capabilities. Each year, uh, EDUCAUSE, which is the Higher Education Technology Group, uh, and the New Media Coalition in the States, puts together a list of the technologies that they think will have the greatest impact in higher education and on libraries over the next several years. On this screen and the next screen, you will see the uh, technologies that I've culled from their analysis that I think are particularly relevant to our thinking and our work over the next couple of days. Uh, clearly, that mobility issue in terms of the, the uh, personal uh, uh, equipment that people use, uh, the growing importance of geo-everything. It's not just the, uh, the geographic systems in our cars. Uh, every discipline is drawing into um, G GS, GS test technologies in order to do two new types of research and to ask new questions. Uh, the importance of linked data and big data. Uh, we're even looking now at uh, how blockchain uh, the cryptocurrencies technologies may have a very important impact on our work in libraries. Um, the sort of classic MOOC, uh, but in fact there has been a, a, a real important revolution in the states in particular in the use of uh, online learning and continuous learning um, through universities and colleges and how libraries fit into that model. Um, games as learning tools, the importance of visualization and simulation 
and the use of 3D printing as, a, as an example of how we're creating very interesting and exciting maker spaces, not just in our public libraries, but also increasingly in our um, academic libraries as well. <clears throat> so the social, political, and economic trends and these technological trends are obviously things that we need to understand and embrace. There will be many others that you will come up with and that we will experience over the next several years. Um, there was a report recently in the States that um, um, in 1997, there were 62,303 people working in North America as Elvis impersonators. And by 2017, 20 years later, that number had increased to 198,704. And if that trend continues, by 2027, one out of three of you would be working in that way. So take, look around and decide who that is, okay? Uh, so trends. So in light of these trends, do the things that we've done still matter? Uh, you know, we do lots of important things. We, we identify the stuff that we think our users need. We get it. We organize it. We help people find it and use it. Uh, we give them a sense of confidence in their use of information. Uh, we get the tools in place so they can apply it to their scholarly work and their, their, their classes. And some of us take responsibility for archiving. Uh, and we do this in support of teaching, learning, research, and scholarship. I would argue these things still matter, although I will question why each of us has to do all of them. Uh, but I think there are a new set of skills that we are beginning to develop and which are increasingly important in the life and work of libraries. Uh, we are learning how to be better consumers, how to come to the table with vendors and publishers and ask hard questions and play hardball in terms of no those negotiations on price and terms. Uh, we have sort of reinvigorated the concept of reader advisor. In this complex, uh, prolific world of information, how do we guide our users uh, to that information which is most relevant, most accurate, most current in response to their, their information needs? Some of us have become active publishers. Uh, we are moving well beyond the concept of information literacy and bibliographic instruction to become much more uh, aggressive and successful partners uh, in the learning enterprise and in our institutions. Uh, we tend to be a profession that makes decisions by the seat of our pants. Uh, we're not really a data-driven uh, profession. I think we need more of a commitment and an understanding of what it means to be a research and development organization. Uh, we need to leverage our assets. We have the assets of expertise, uh, content, technology, space. Uh, how can that be used in a more productive ways uh, to drive our, our programs, but also to feed our, our budgets? Uh, I often say that I was raised in a culture of uh, budget allocation, resource allocation, but I now live in a world of resource attraction. That is my job as a library administrator, is to get the resources, to grow the resources beyond what my university or my government is, is able to provide me. Uh, how many of you know the Project, uh, project Muse, uh, which is the uh, e-journal publishing project in the humanities, largely? Well, that actually was born in the libraries at Johns Hopkins University when I was there. And we took it to the university press. And to this day, the net profits from that continue to go to the library's budget. Uh, the most beautiful library in North America, the Peabody Library, look it up, you'll agree with me, um, was one of the libraries I was responsible for at Hopkins. And we ran it as a special collections library by day, and every night we opened it up for uh, social events and on the weekends, and the last year I was there we did 72 wedding receptions. Um, so, uh, um, and it was a real source of revenue. Uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the libraries. We also need to learn how to play the political game, how to be effective advocates for our communities, for our users in a lot of these legislative and legal environments in which we find ourselves. So we have this schizophrenic vision, how people look at us. We have this sense of legacy, that we are responsible for centuries of information, yes that we are an infrastructure, as I said, of, of technology and expertise and content, 
Uh, we are a repository. We have some long-term preservation roles and responsibilities. We are a, a gateway uh, to the best information. We are a platform and set of applications that allow people to use particularly the growing amounts of digital information. We are enterprise. We have more sense of our business role and responsibility. And we are one of the few organizations in our nations and in our communities that has the public interest as our top priority. Uh, and I think that's an important vision and expectation of us that we need to preserve and, and take advantage of, I would think. So, given uh, where we find ourselves in terms of how we're perceived, we are seen as playing a very important role in the national and global digital library development. I think an important change in our thinking has been the quality of that work is not just equal to the content we digitize, but the functionality of it, what people are able to do with that information. And the largest digital library we have at this point is still, I think, our published and our licensed content. We're going to come back to that. But I think it still serves as those e-journals, those e-books, the e-media stuff that we provide to our users. Some of us are beginning to convert large quantities of our special collections uh, and making that available on the web to uh, users and researchers all over the world. Some of us are beginning to touch uh, the born digital materials, uh, open web content, come back to that. Uh, we have an expanding responsibility at many of our institutions for working with our researchers to capture and preserve uh, the research data. What we know about all this digital content is that it's increasingly multimedia, it's integrated with services, the ability to use it, and with the necessity of applications, software tools, in order to make it work. Um, which means that the commitment to preservation and archiving is far more complicated, obviously, with digital information. Uh, we have lost, in my view, the connection between collection development and pres preservation. You can't preserve what you don't have. And I think we need to sort of remind ourselves that that is an important principle of archiving and preservation. Not only do we have to make sure that we've got it, but we have to make sure that it continues to be accessible over time. And we preserve not only the content, but the functionality in terms of its, our ability to use it. We need to secure it, and we have faced lots of challenges to the security of our digital information. I want to sweep down a little bit and talk about the issue of born digital. I notice that one of the poster sessions uh, begins to talk about this. Um, I will put in front of you that this is our collective biggest failure as a global library community. Um, if you write a journal article, right, and in your paper you cite a half dozen web sources as evidence for your presentation, and I read it six months later and I say, wow, this is interesting. I'd like to see those sources that that person used in their, in their uh, presentation. And I go out and look for them and I can't find them because they're gone. They've been taken down, they've been moved, they've been changed. I say, did you make this all up? I have to raise the question of the um, scholarly integrity of the process. Our ability to write and research and talk about the first two decades of this century is dependent on our ability to access and use born digital material. It'll be gone. And we have tried to solve this problem through a series of, of repositories, um, which I call repository chaos, uh, when works are deposited in multiple sites and we don't know which one's going to be cited, which one's going to be used, which one's going to be preserved, which one's not going to be changed. What's the repository of record? And I think we have some real, real challenges. So think about the diversity of the types of born digital content. License material. Uh, you know, we made the conversion many years ago from print journals to e-journals. And we've assured the faculties at our universities, don't worry about that. We've got this all under control. We're preserving this stuff. So that if something happens with our access, we can continue to provide you with access. So we developed two systems in the States. One was called a Portico, where the publishers deposit their materials in a third party repository. The libraries pay for it. The other was called Locks and Clocks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe, locks, based at Stanford University, where individual libraries take responsibility for preserving material. Well, Columbia University and Cornell University, which have a partnership, that's a story in itself, which we'll come back to, 
decided, let's take our 180,000 e-journals that we have at our institutions, individual titles, and let's run them against these two national systems of preservation archiving. <clears throat> How many of those 180,000 titles do you think we found in those two databases? 17% which meant 83% of the journals were not being preserved. And we just looked at the title level, not at the historical chronological coverage. Real problem. No e-books are being preserved, period. And we know that last year in North America, 250,000 new books were published by um, academic and trade publishers, many of them e. 250,000 were published by small and independent presses many of them E, and 500,000 new books were self-published, many of them E, none of them being preserved. A real challenge, I think, to our community. But look at all the other stuff. We all know about video and audio and digital government. 90% uh, of the US government information is E only. We talked about research data. How do we deal with issues of social media and all the E archives? Um, we at Columbia, and I'm sure at your institutions, are starting to get deposits of material uh, like Amiri Baraka, Leroy Jones, the poet, the African-American poet, uh, jazz musician, political activist, uh, made a gift of all of his papers uh, to the libraries at Columbia University. He brought over all the boxes, but he also gave us seven hard drives of email on seven different email systems extending back into the early 90s. That's where the good stuff is and we need to find a way to take care of it and migrate it forward so that it continues to be usable. Websites and web documents, billions of sources of information that are lost and are put up and then lost. And I think we have a responsibility. We have great projects going on around the world and some of our national governments are collecting domain information, but it's a, like a sand, a piece of sand on the beach here in Galway in terms of what percentage of what we're really taking care of. And it gets worse. Visual images and spatial data and software and video games and medical data with all of its related privacy problems. Live feeds like RSS and news feeds, so on and so on and so on. It's a huge challenge that we need to wrap our collective energy around. And I said we created this sort of repository chaos. Uh, in 1980, when I wrote a paper, I knew what repository it went into. It went into the publisher repository. But now, under the um, motivation of open access and other, other strategies, it's appearing in multiple places. And this is sort of my inventory of the places that I've observed where works are getting deposited. And I'll raise the question again. Uh, which one gets cited? Which one gets preserved? Which one does not get changed? I think this is uh, increasingly uh, a tough issue for us in the library community. We also have this uh, mandate in the United States uh, to um, preserve, to collect and preserve um, uh, big data, scientific data, research data. So we went around to the faculties at Columbia and to figure out what they were doing. We said, could you tell us where your research data is being stored? And they would go over to their file cabinet and they would open a drawer and say, well, here it is. And it's like on all these different formats of, of, um, uh, uh, of, of technology, uh, most of which is no longer usable, uh, which is a real challenge. Uh, we know these data sets are massive. Uh, we know that to a large extent they're unstructured. They need curation. Uh, but our users say, I've got to have it. I've got to go back and get it. I want to distribute it. I want to collaborate with scholars around the world. Um, I want to use it for visualization and simulation examples. Um, and aren't you taking care of it? Aren't you preserving it, librarians? Um, I think this is a, an area, again, of frustration and to some extent failure uh, on our part. When we go out to researchers, and this sort of aligns with uh, sort of our new partnership, perhaps, with the faculties at our institutions. I once did a paper in 2001 where I talked about the relationship between librarians and, and faculty, and I did a taxonomy of that relationship. And one of, at one end of the taxonomy was servant. Um, in the middle, I had stranger. Uh, and at the bottom, I had partner, which was the ultimate goal that I saw for our relationship. And so when we reached out to faculties at a number of institutions around the states, this is what they told us. 
they really wanted the library to do. They wanted help in navigating, analyzing, and synthesizing, synthesizing information, because it was out of control. They didn't know how to really manage all the information they needed. They wanted more support and understanding of what open research and open scholarly communication looks like. Uh, they recognized that they were moving from sort of the concept of a scholarly product, a journal article, a monograph, to more of a scholarly process, more of a scholarly conversation that takes place with their work. They wanted deeper thinking about expertise databases, subject ontologies that would give them guidance in finding information. They didn't know how to manage their data. They wanted help. They wanted to understand how to work with the expanding array of gray literature, uh, a lot of it born digital. And they wanted more of a, this was an interpretation, they wanted more of an informationalist model, uh, more of a sense of the librarian working in the corporate structure uh, to assist and drive the success of their research. I thought this was an important set of findings and one which I think attracts the interest of a lot of the librarians. Um, one of the biggest issues, among the bigger issues that we're facing, not institutional but collective on a global scale, is the recognition that this sense of privacy, and I know you've worked through that as a European community, and we're responding in, in many ways in the States to the leadership you've demonstrated, but we know that the surveillance, whether it's under the impact of national security or uh, driven by economic interests, uh, we know that the sense of privacy is gone. Uh, we know that there's this dependence on access uh, to um, electronic data and the security meltdowns um, increasingly of concern. Things disappearing, things no longer accessible. Uh, we are wrestling through the issue of network neutrality in the States. Uh, in 2015, rules were put in place that says everything passes through the internet equally. No information is favored over other information. No user is favored over any other user. Well, two weeks ago, that died in the United States. We no longer have network neutrality. We have states who are raising it up, individual states. We have lawsuits. We have Congress trying to work on it, but the fact is the dynamics of the internet will shift over time. And who, who controls search? We don't control search. We all know that. And so where do the Googles of this world fit in in terms of uh, people's ability to find and use information? If you combine that corporate control with network neutrality and massive surveillance, you understand the conundrum that we find ourselves in terms of uh, some of these meta issues related to our digital libraries. Let me talk a little bit about open access. Um, we know that uh, access to scholarly information is driven by a variety of parameters, uh, whether it's the market, that is the cost, whether it's the technology um, uh, that we need to access and use it, whether it's the law, copyright, or whether it's the norms, the way we've always done this as a researcher and a scholar. All of these sort of get in the way of equitable access to scholarly information. Uh, whether it's the creation, the evaluation, the distribution, use or preservation of this information, we know that the economics are shifting, the technologies that underpin access to scholarly works is changing, and the players and policies, I think, are also shifting. So it's, it's part of that mutability trend that we talked about earlier. When we build new systems of access to scholarly information, we can't lose sight of what the motivations are of the scholars that we serve. This is the way they communicate with each other. Uh, this is part of the academic culture in which they've been raised. They produce scholarly work, they publish it, they move on to the next project. This is the way their ideas get preserved. This is the way they achieve prestige and recognition. And for a few, let's call them textbook writers, uh, there's even a case of profit involved, financial reward. Um, the researchers are telling us a lot of things. Um, and here's a, I'll just highlight a few, a few of these. They recognize that there's a sort of a meritocracy built into the scholarly communication systems that needs to be preserved. Um, they recognize that there are new modes of discourse beyond the journal and beyond the book that they need to understand and embrace. Uh, they know that when they publish online, there is expanded readership. It's not just this narrow disciplinary community uh, that they are writing for. Uh, but the trust and credibility that needs to be maintained in the system are things that they really care about. Um, 
And I think these are important concepts that we need to embrace as we build out new approaches to scholarly communication. They told us a couple of things. Uh, they're choking on the proliferation. Um, they're concerned about where the quality marking of their work is going to go. Um, we know that we have made this migration from a corporate economy to a guild economy. What's the next economy that's going to take over uh, the responsibility for uh, the uh, distribution and preservation of scholarly work? Um, the transfer of ownership from researcher to publisher, uh, which for whatever reason we just haven't been able to dismantle. Um, um, I think there are Darwinian solutions, let the strong survive. I think we've lost that battle. Uh, there might be capitalistic solutions, let's bring back the means of production into the university. Um, let's take on the research publishing role. We haven't done very well at that. Um, maybe there are socialist solutions um, where this is sort of common ownership of goods. Uh, we've tried to do that with policy in the states by mandating that if you get a federal grant, your information must be made publicly available, openly available. Um, and as a result, we have lots of new modes of digital scholarship. We have not addressed the primary source of motivation here, which is the quality assessment system, that recognition uh, uh, of a person's career, of a person's work. We've experimented with other forms of peer review, uh, but what holds up is that top concept, traditional, double-blind peer review in order in the top journals. Um, and I think this open access approach has become very confused. I've been working on open access since the early 1990s when we conceived of and started Spark, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. Spark continues to play a robust and important role in our thinking and advancement of the concept of open access to information. But it's become this muddle of different approaches. In some cases, it's a business model. In some cases, when we give uh, access in developing countries, it's a social policy. Um, in some cases, uh, individual authors can sign contracts with their publishers to make their information open access. So it's become a multi-headed monster in many ways, open access. And maybe it's time to step back and sort of rethink it. Now we have obviously movement in Europe around the future of the big deal and sort of um, some bravery around the in, uh, in negotiations uh, with publishers, some real leadership there. And so we're very interested in the states to see how that will develop it. We want a competitive market. I don't think we have it. Uh, we want easy distribution and reuse of information. I don't think we have it. Uh, we want innovative applications of technology. Uh, I think we see some early efforts in that direction, but it's still basically uh, text which is being put online. We want to maintain quality, and that's part of, part of the uh, concern of the, of the academics. And we want permanent archiving, which we see, based on evidence, is a problem. Uh, so that's sort of my spin on, um, on scholarly publishing and open access in terms of our working relationships with, with uh, authors. So we intersect with our users in a whole variety of ways. Uh, we used to see them in the library. That was where we interacted primarily with our users in our physical spaces. Now we see them in all the various applications, technologies, and places uh, in which we serve our users. I would like to see more of our professional staffs out of the library away from the reference desk, get rid of the reference desks, classroom, laboratory, bedside, research, learning collaborations between faculty and librarian. Um, I think this is the direction we have to move. And we need to figure out how we know about our users in a much more in intimate and effective and privacy respecting way. Um, we sometimes ask surveys, uh, sometimes we uh, do focus groups. Um, sometimes we have sort of these anthropological observational studies. Uh, a few of us have done some comparisons and benchmarks. Um, but the, the, the real, for me at least, the experience that carries the most weight has been that sort of aha moment when we are actually with our users in their work and see and observe and experience what they are experiencing. Um, our users um, have expectations. Um, Charles Kuralt, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, Charles Kuralt was a newscaster in the United States, very popular one. And he once noted that thanks to the interstate highway system in the States, 
I could travel from New York to San Francisco and see absolutely nothing. Um, sort of like driving from Dublin to Galway. You know, you, you know that's the comparison. Um, but we hear from our users, they want more and better content, more and better access. They want convenience. They want to do things that they've never been able to do before. Uh, they want productivity. They want to control and participate in their information environments. And I think, historically, the top-down approach we've taken to information access and use has been, um, um, I think, not always responsive to these expectations. They want technology everywhere. Uh, they want help when they need it. Uh, Web-based services, that is no lines, obviously. Uh, privacy, we want, we, want, we want to support their social success. Uh, their information fluency. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we have faced in the States is, you know, we provide these massive collections of e-journals and e-books and e-everything. And then six months after our students leave the university, they no longer have access to any of this stuff. Um, and sort of that, it's, it's a shock to them that, you know, somebody at the university was actually paying for them to have access to use these materials. And so we have that postgraduate trauma that a lot of our uh, students experience. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to come up with sort of ROI, um, what I call the uh, insanity of ROI, uh, return on investment, the tyranny of data, when I think we need to spend more time on the qualitative relationship we have our users. Are they successful? Are they happy? Are they making productive change? Are they making progress? Do we enable them to establish new relationships, have new experiences, and to have impact in their world? How do we draw a line between what we do in library and these expectations and needs, what I call the human objective, that our users bring to their interaction with us. Um, our institutions are asking us hard questions. Uh, they want to know, how do you know that your users are satisfied? How do you know that you're penetrating the markets that you've been asked to take care of? How do you know you're successful and how you're, that you're having impact, that you are cost effective? that the systems that you're designing, you just don't throw them over the wall, but you are really focused on an iterative uh, uh, usability, um, and that uh, what I call the insanity of ROI and the, the tyranny of metrics. Uh, so I think we've got some real tough challenges in this arena of assessment and support for our users. Um, are our students successful? Are our faculty productive? Do we support the campus economy? Do we align with our institutional values? Do we enhance the reputation of our universities? Yes, we are increasingly virtual. That is pushing more and more of our content and services out. But it means we also need to preserve our virtuosity, our expertise to remain a viable partner in the academic community. But we also have this public interest, this commandment to work together in very different and energetic ways, sort of that virtuous quality. Um, uh, and so I think we need to keep, uh, keep these, uh, these models and expectations in mind. So research and development. Uh, I argue that we don't do a very good job in this area. We are not very information data driven. We're an information profession that doesn't make a whole lot of information based decisions. Uh, for me, R&D is about what do I care about? Uh, what does my institution care about? Uh, what does my profession care about? And is there a national need? Because if there's a national need, there might be national funding uh, in terms of grants and support. R&D, I think, has a broad sweep of positive impact across the library. Um, it helps us create new knowledge. It creates a culture of experimentation. It brings new skills and capabilities into the work of the library. Um, to me, it helps us solve library problems, information problems, technology problems. Um, it's a way to think about technology transfer. Stuff that we develop in the library can be moved out into the larger, larger community. For us, it's a source of foundation and federal funding. Uh, it supports decision making. It creates a sense of organizational risk. I think these are all positive aspects of incorporating and embracing research and development, even at a very modest scale, as part of our institutional and our collective work. Um, in libraries. I think we're also being asked, are we um, uh, being innovative uh, in terms of being entrepreneurial 
in terms of how we serve our community and the products that we are responsible for? Uh, are we penetrating the markets that we're uh, assigned to? Are we extending the markets for the products that we have developed and support our communities with? Are we developing new products? And are we diversifying the products and markets that we serve? We don't think very often in the sort of market development, product development way. But I would argue it's an important part of our entrepreneurial responsibility. Another interesting aspect of our entrepreneurial work is how we are rethinking our space planning and our space identity. I talked earlier about the Trump Loy library space. Uh, we know that with technology as a catalyst and with the library trends that we talked about, we're now looking obviously at libraries as much more as learning space, as social space, as collaborative space, and we're designing and building for flexibility and adaptability. So the marketing and the space development to me are two important examples of how we can be more effective as entrepreneurs. Um, planning. Um, I gave a talk at the Australian Library Association uh, last February, and they said, Jim, you're coming all this way to give your opening talk. Uh, don't you think you want to do a workshop too? I think they were trying to justify the cost of the ticket. Um, but um, I suggested that um, I would. I would love to do a workshop. Um, I said there should be half, it should be half day, and I think we should have a maximum of 50 people. And the topic of my workshop will be strategic planning is a waste of time and a waste of resources. They agreed. In two hours, it was fully booked. Um, now, my argument wasn't that strategic planning um, is, in fact, a waste of time and resources. It's just that we never take it to strategic thinking and action. Um, there's too little strategic thinking and action coming out of our planning work. I often will go to a library uh, to do a review or assessment of some kind, and they'll say, Jim, look at our strategic plan. Isn't it wonderful? We worked on it for the last three years. I said, well, then it's no longer strategic if you've been working on it for three years. So this, we're built for a slower pace of change in libraries. We need to change that thinking. Uh, we don't link it to the goals of our institution, our colleges and universities very often. We're out of sync. Uh, we don't put money behind the things that we say are important. Uh, I argue if you really, really want to see a library's strategic plan, look at its budget, because that will tell you what they think is really important. Uh, we're sort of in fiscal year mode, um, academic year mode. Uh, that's not the way strategy works. Uh, we don't have accountability. We don't say, we are going to do this, and you are responsible, and here's the time frame, and here's the resources. Uh, it tends to get kind of mushy uh, once the plan uh, is done. And we don't drive it to organizational performance. We don't criticize ourselves in terms of our ability to move these things forward. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do what you said I should do. Um, so, um, and I'm, I apologize if you've heard this story before, but uh, Bernard Shaw, we say Bernard in the States, but I, Bernard Shaw was opening a new play in London, and he wrote a letter to Winston Churchill saying, Dear Mr. Churchill, um, I'm enclosing two tickets to the opening night's performance of my new play, and I would um, have one for you and one for a friend, if you have one. Uh, well, Churchill quickly replied, said, Dear Mr. Shaw, unfortunately, I have another commitment that evening, and I will not be able to attend the opening night's performance of your new play but I would be very appreciative if you would send me two tickets to the second night's performance, if there is one. Um, <laughs> and so I think it's timely here in that we need to be focused. Library of the future, will there be one? I think will depend on our ability to move from traditional strategic planning to much more of a focus on strategic thinking and action. Uh, we work in a lot of information policy arenas. Uh, ranging from issues of privacy and intellectual freedom, uh, civil liberties, uh, down through the internet and telecommunications. Uh, we have a, a whole shift coming in the states around government information, new legislation. I've been fighting the copyright wars uh, for 20 years, um, both in the states and in Geneva at WIPO. So we're sort of part of this. And this is, this is one of the areas where we can't do it alone. There's hope, power, and action through collaboration. I'll come back to that theme. We need to be knowledgeable resources for the communities that we serve. Uh, we need to be embracing of our political work, 
uh, to influence legislative and legal action, educating our communities, because the legislators don't just want to hear from us, they want to hear from people in our communities that it does make a difference. When legislation have changed, what happens, what's the impact on our ability to serve our users? So we're seeing much more of a heightened commitment and understanding of the importance and role of political advocacy. Uh, more time tomorrow on, on this uh, organization on staff stuff, but I would like to share some ideas because I think they're relevant here. Um, I would say, I call this the current lie because these are characteristics that I would argue d d we say do, but in fact don't define most of our communities. Uh, administrative responsibility and authority are distributed and shared, right? That exists in all of our institutions. Um, our operations and procedures are, are, are integrated and flexible. That exists in all of our institutions, right? Uh, policies and norms are designed and enforced, and fluidity and vitality are parts of our sense of productivity and success. Our organizations tend to be uh, hierarchical and bureaucratic. We need centralized planning, but I would argue we need more what I call loosely coupled structures that sit around the central administration of any organization. And in order to fulfill and carry forward that entrepreneurial commitment, we need more maverick units, units that sort of operate outside the norm and are doing that type of experimental work and pushing, pushing the edge in terms of what the library is and does. Uh, we need to move as much as we can our, our libraries to the this side. <laughs> I was going that way. We, I find we find ourselves here, and a lot of our organizational structures need to move here uh, in terms of the culture of the organizations that we develop and maintain and grow in, in our libraries. Um, people who work in our libraries, uh, we have all kinds of diverse academic backgrounds. Um, we have a whole range of new professional assignments. Um, lots of new support being provided by paraprofessional support staff, technical staff, and our students. Um, and what I hope will be more messy and fluid organizational structures. Um, I am no longer the uh, vice president at Columbia responsible for IT and for libraries, but before I left, I asked the HR staff in the library to do an analysis of the academic credentials of the people who worked in professional roles in the library. And we had 330 professional positions in the library, and 67% of those individuals did not have the MLS degree. Now that's not a argument that I'm making, I'm not championing that as the goal, but it's an observation that the nature of the roles and responsibilities in the libraries had shifted dramatically. So publishers and systems engineers and web developers and instructional technologists and copyright lawyers and HR specialists and fundraisers and space planners and on and on and on uh, were increasingly important to what we did. So people said, Jim, when you interview somebody, what are you looking for? So I decided to put a slide together. And so I said, this is what I'm looking for. Um, now obviously no one person brings that. Um, but collectively, I would say an organization, or collectively a profession needs to have those, those goals. And the things that I think are increasingly important are issues of political engagement, um, entrepreneurial spirit, commitment to collaboration, and more and more an understanding and commitment to social justice. Uh, to me, these are increasingly relevant and important values in terms of what we want professional staff, all staff for that matter, to bring to the work of the library. Every individual here should have a strategic plan. Why did you join this profession? Why did you choose to become a librarian? What is your mission? What do you want to accomplish in your work as a librarian? What is your vision? Not only do you have a base of knowledge, but what's your commitment to continuous improvement? Your attendance here is an example of that. I often will ask somebody I'm interviewing for a job, okay, you're interviewing for this job here, what's the next job you're going to apply for somewhere else? Um, not to disrupt them, although it often does. Um, it was an effort to, um, to uh, see if they're looking at this as a career, a path that they were on. And will they develop that professional voice that it's not just the job that they do, but they have a larger commitment to the profession in writing and speaking, and consulting and teaching and, and so forth. All right, cooperate. We know how to cooperate in libraries. Uh, we cooperate all over the place. Uh, and we're seeing more and more working with museums and archives and more and more public-private um, uh, intersections in that cooperative space. Uh, I call this the kumbaya of library cooperation. 
It's a good thing. It's a necessary thing. But it's not enough. We need to radicalize it. As I said, not all of us can have centers for excellence. Individually, we can build it and then share it and, 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 and embrace it together. We can't all continue to maintain these mass production operations in our libraries. We don't have enough resources. We have lots of new things we want to do. New infrastructures, new initiatives should always be started together. Cornell and Columbia thought about this a number of years ago. So we have Columbia University Libraries, CUL, and Cornell University Libraries, CUL. We called ourselves Too Cool, because you start with the acronym, right? And then we're ready for the third one, Catholic University or Colgate University Libraries. Uh, it's gonna be Trey Cool, but that's the way it goes. Um, so radicalizing that relationship. Okay, my last thing, leadership. Uh, how many of you go into an interview and you're asked, what is your philosophy of leadership? Well, I said, well, I'm going to write it down. This is what I think. I think that as a leader, and not just the director, it's just not that charismatic person. It's everyone within an organization who has leadership roles and responsibilities. Um, how do I set help in setting a direction? How do I hire and develop really great people to work in this organization? How do I secure the necessary resources, attract the necessary resources? How do I ask the hard questions? Do I have a professional voice? And do I have the, the, the chutzpah to get out of the way uh, when things are getting done? To me, that last point is the hardest responsibility of leadership. Um, by innovation, are we developing new markets? Do we add value? Are we bringing solutions to what we are doing? Um, obviously, we're being transformed. We're being thought differently about what we are and what we do how we are viewed and how we are understood by the communities we serve, and ultimately how we do it. Um, so Albert Einstein, when he came to the United States, never took a plane. He always traveled around the United States by train. Makes me kind of nervous having to fly back to the States. But um, So he was on such a trip, and the clerk came around to collect the tickets, and suddenly Einstein starts digging in his pockets looking for his ticket, and the person says, oh, Dr. Einstein, don't worry, you don't need to find your ticket, You're, it's okay. But Einstein persists, and he crawls on the floor, and he lifts up his seat, and again, the young man says, Dr. Einstein, please stop, you don't need to find your ticket. Einstein whirls around, looks him in the eye, and says, young man, it is no longer a matter of whether I can find my ticket, it's a matter of where I am going. Um, <laughs> We spend too much time as librarians worrying about finding our tickets and not enough about where we are going. I attended a play in New York uh, several years ago called Extinction, and I learned that there are actually two definitions of extinction. Terminal extinction, where the species disappears. What is that, the northern white rhinoceros, right? Go, it's gone from the world, never to exist again. Maybe DNA will solve, solve that problem. Uh, but there's also this thing called phyletic extinction. Who knew? Uh, where one species evolves into a new species and combines with other species. And to me, I would argue, we're, we're pushing ourselves, hopefully, towards a phyletic extinction. And I couldn't resist adding a sixth title uh, for you to consider. This is from Tony Kushner, who actually is a friend of mine, uh, from Angels in America Part Two, which was called Perestroika. And it says, if the snake sheds his skin, before a new skin is ready, naked he will be in the world, prey to the forces of chaos. I think we need to embrace a lot of the ideas and a lot of the themes, a lot of the trends that we talked about this morning in this presentation. I think it strengthens us as a, as a profession. It strengthens us in terms of our ability to serve and work with the students and faculty and researchers at our institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I, war I, I said in my opening remarks, uh, I warned against complacency and hubris. I suggest if you were feeling complacent beforehand, you're probably not now. Um, but we are tight for time, so I think we probably have uh, 
time for one quick question for Jim, but I'm pleased to say Jim is here for the rest of the conference and is participating in the panel discussion tomorrow afternoon. So you will have ample opportunity to raise, I'm sure, I'm looking at Twitter here, Jim touched on so many issues, neutrality, the role of leadership, um, the importance of digitization versus preservation and so on. So I'm sure there are lots of questions, but maybe we'll just take one now for Jim and then please follow up with him over the next couple of days or tomorrow at the panel discussion. So uh, do we have any one quick question? Anyone? I'm sure there are. You? You, you, you accept everything I said, right? <laughs> we have one over here, Jim. Okay. Oh, yes. Hi, sorry. Just uh, there'll be a mic with you there in just one second. Sorry, uh, While the mic is making its way to you, you'll notice to the left here there's a door and the breakout sessions are happening through those doors. So there's one here and then two out through those doors. So after the question, please make your way there. I'll make a quick, uh, firstly, thank you. But um, can I just ask you, you spoke about the tyranny of data and metrics, and yet a lot of the things that we as, as a profession need to prove are at least our ostensible importance are increasingly metric-based. So how do you re reconcile those two, two opposing forces? Well, there's forces? Two, two points I was trying to make. One is we can't just embrace the quantitative. We need to also embrace the qualitative. We need to understand what difference we do makes in the quality of life and experience of our faculty and students. So I would say we need to embrace both. And what I see is a migration to sort of metric-based, data-based, and not enough focus on the qualitative. The second is, um, we don't know how to do ROI and metrics-based research. It's naive, it's misunderstood, and I watch libraries go before their, their boards of trustees, their government organizations, and present these data, and any, any experienced business person on those, on those boards is gonna look at it and see right through it. Uh, so we need to be not only building a more uh, a balanced approach to qualitative and quantitative metrics, if you will, but also learning how to do this stuff well and knowing how to present our results, results effectively. I would say we, we're, we're not doing that right now. Okay, okay thank okay. you very much. One last uh, thing I have to do, it's my pleasure on behalf of Connell to thank Jim for his wonderful keynote and to present him with a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.